Here's a story of a scary incident that took place in the early 90s. At that time, I was just out of high school and working my first full-time job. I had no interest in going to college then, so my only option was joining the workforce and becoming an actual adult. My job was a night auditor. If you're not aware of what a night auditor does, the job basically requires to do everything from check-in guests all the way to setting up wake-up calls and balancing accounts for the night. Despite only being 19 and at the usual level of lazy for a kid my age, I loved my job. Well, I loved it most of the time, but when crazy things happened, like what I'm about to tell you, it was probably the worst job in the world. Possibly the scariest thing I have ever experienced occurred on a quiet Monday night. Now before you hear this story, I should tell you more about the hotel I worked in. It will help in the telling of the story later on, so don't worry. The place was set up in a similar way to those rundown hotels you see in movies. You had your usual covered drive-in at the check-in desk that led into a big parking lot with spaces in front of the rooms. Despite the fact that there were three stories, I was told never to check anyone into any of the third story rooms because of strange occurrences in the past, but that's a tale for another time. Although I may make the place sound massive, in truth I could see every room from the desk. My only blind spots sat just around from the windows and I could check those on my walkthroughs. Since I'm on the subject of walkthroughs, I'll place the actual beginning of my tale right here. As I said, this happened on a quiet Monday, which was one of the slowest nights for customers. During the tourist season, we did pretty brisk business all through the week and weekends, but it was the middle of the winter and the hotel had never been smack dab in the middle of the tourist roads. You had to see one of our billboard ads or know where we were at already. So if I was lucky enough to check anyone in, it was usually one of our regulars. The night this happened, I had just finished one of my walkthroughs, checking that there was ice in the machines, things like that. I had just returned to the desk and sat down in the office located behind it. From what I remember, I was doing paperwork when I happened to look up at the bay of monitors for the security cameras and spotted a guy in black standing just out of view of the windows out front. Being naturally curious, I continued watching him while he stood there looking around for anyone in the area. I guess when he was satisfied that nobody was watching, he pulled a black ski mask from his pocket and put it over his head and face. I didn't see a weapon at the time, but I sure wasn't going to give him time to pull it out. Since I had a good idea what he had planned, I ran as fast as I could to lock the front door so he couldn't do it. I could see him through the windows as we both ran for the doors, but I got to them first and turned the deadbolt just before his hand touched the handle. The mask he was wearing had a hole for the mouth and a sneer of disgust slowly grew on it. Seeing how angry this made him, my stupid smug self mocked him with the biggest grin I could manage. He slowly raised his hand and that's when I finally saw the gun. The smug grin disappeared from my face and was replaced by a look of abject fear. I couldn't see my face of course but I could tell from the smile growing on his he knew he was in charge. When his hand reached my eye level, I could literally see down the barrel of the gun. As he pulled back the hammer, the cylinder turned and clicked. Everything seemed to be moving in slow motion. Then, like he was putting an exclamation at the end of the sentence, he put the barrel to the glass. When he put his finger on the trigger, I honestly saw my life flash before me. It hadn't been a long one, and it was about to end. That's about the time I peed myself. I'm not going to lie, it happened. For a second, I considered trying to make a break for it, but when I attempted to move, I was frozen stiff. So, in an act of acceptance, I closed my eyes and waited for the shot, but it never came. I have no idea how long I stood there, but when I finally got the courage to open my eyes, he was gone. I could feel my knees about to buckle, and a queasiness filled my stomach. There was a row of chairs next to me and I managed to sit down before I collapsed. As I sat there, crouched over with my head between my knees fighting the urge to vomit, I tried to figure out why I wasn't dead. Did he take pity on me? Did he not have the guts? Really, I didn't care. I was just happy to be alive and if I ever meet that guy again in different circumstances, I'll thank him for not pulling that trigger. The idea of calling the cops went through my head but decided against it. They would most likely be unable to catch the guy and 
I couldn't identify him. What I was going to do was change my pants and quit this terrible job at this terrible hotel and go to college after all. I finished off the night and quit the next morning. I told my boss about the attempted holdup and the guy with the mask, just out of courtesy, in case he decided to come back and that was it. I enrolled at the local community college that spring. After my two years there, I moved on to a large Californian university where I eventually earned my MBA and went on to work at various corporations around Southern California and Nevada. I'm finally working for myself as a consultant and employ several others. Despite the overwhelming fear I felt that night, the incident ultimately turned out to be the wake-up call I needed to get my life in the right direction. I had spent so long in school I was in no hurry to move on to another. Besides, I'd witnessed the success of some of my friends were having without going to college and I'd convinced myself it had nothing to offer me. However, I learned that night a lesson I'd like to pass on to young people just out of school. If you truly believe college is not for you, don't go. But you owe it to yourself to be very sure. Because if your life turns out to be different than you had hoped, you could end up like either one of those men, staring at each other through those glass doors all those years ago. Recently, I was re-watching The Civil War, a PBS documentary by Ken Burns made in 1990 that was, of course, about the war between the North and South in the mid-19th century. Seeing this again reminded me of a terrifying incident I suffered almost 25 years ago. The experience itself didn't involve ghosts or creepy creatures, but at the time was just as mortifying as any of those things. At that point in my life, I was living in Chambersburg, a somewhat small town in Pennsylvania, not far from the state capital, Harrisburg. I was visiting several towns and cities in South Carolina and Georgia to do research for a new historical novel I was writing set during the Civil War. My trip was moving into its second week after I took a longer than expected stop off in South Carolina to visit a former sorority sister. Once I had gotten back on track, my work was moving at a quick clip and because of that, I hoped to make it back home by the end of the month like I'd planned. I'm aware most of you out there reading this may not understand, but this was at the time when the internet was still in its early days and most of the information available now was not then. If you needed to compile a large amount of information about a certain area or event, you had to go to the place and pore over their records. Of course you could, and still can, find some facts from books, but any book could only provide only so much information. Therefore, a beginning writer who lacked the money to afford a researcher to do the work for her had to do it for herself. By the time I reached Atlanta, I was sick of being in a car and was looking forward to finding a hotel and getting some rest before I had to make the long drive back home. My plans at Atlanta only required a half a day's work and the extra two days were set aside for sleeping and sightseeing. I made it there, and none too soon, since I had been nodding out for the last hour. Not being a wealthy woman, I had to find a place that was budget-oriented, so to speak. With a bit of driving, I found a middle-of-the-line place and pulled in. The guy at the counter was a kind but fragrant fellow that was all too eager to help me. As I was standing at the desk, a couple entered while engaging in a full-blown argument. Like anyone else, I looked over at the couple, curious about them and what they were arguing about, but the male soon noticed me and asked me what I was looking at. All he could manage was a shrug since I was a tad surprised at his reaction. Mind your own business or I'll black your eye. This threat left me even more confused and I was afraid he was about to approach me. But he turned and left the lobby with the woman, rejoining the argument right where he left off. I looked to the counterman to see his reaction but his expression showed that he was well accustomed with this type of clientele. I was so bewildered by the whole scene, I took my key and drove over to my room. When I reached my room I was pleasantly surprised, sarcasm to see that the couple was only two doors down from me. Their room door stood wide open and the male walked in and out of the room, pacing with a beer can in his hand. To my relief, neither of them noticed me. They must have been more focused on each other's words as they continued to argue over God knows what. I was finally able to take a breath once my door was closed and enjoy the quiet, but that wouldn't last for long. 
With the room's air conditioner roaring, I was easily able to fall asleep. But by that evening, I was awakened by a big racket akin to a cannon blast. I dragged my groggy body from the bed and peeked through the corner of the curtains. Once again, all the noise came from that one couple. Boxes were being thrown from their room out into the parking lot and the man, by this time, was stumbling and yelling with a loud, slurred voice. Loud bangs shook the walls of the building despite there being an empty room between us, and the female's voice, although being somewhat muffled, was still easily heard. Not being a person that liked confrontation, especially after what had happened earlier, I tried to ignore them and drown out the noise with the television, but after 30 minutes of it, I called the front desk. My hope was he could convince them to quiet down a little since he'd appeared to know them. I asked him not to mention who had made the complaint and he promised he would not, but once I thought about it, it'd be pretty obvious it was me. Going back to my TV viewing, I waited to see if my call would make any difference. At first, it seemed to have worked. The chaos had stopped and I could no longer hear anything at all. Relieved, I let out a sigh and leaned back on the headboard to relax. That was when the knock came. At first, it seemed like a bad idea to answer it, but once I had a second to think about it, I considered the possibility that they wanted to apologize for bothering me and that's why I ultimately did. Naturally, this was the worst idea I could have had. When I opened the door, I had on my disarmingly charming smile. But the man wasn't there to apologize, and the smile quickly melted from my face. Look here, you uppity Yankee. If you make one more complaint, I'm gonna kick your backside all the way to back across the Mason-Dixon line. When he said this, big gobs of spit flew all over me, and his choice of words were in no way as nice as what I'd written here. His words made it sound like the last 130 years hadn't occurred. I couldn't believe there were people in the South that still sounded like this. Although, I was certainly scared to death, especially since I was a lone female so far away from home, a small part of me was entranced by this man's words. However, I was far more scared and had no idea how to react. My silence seemed to make him angrier and his face grew redder and redder. That was when I said the only thing that I thought may make him go away. Look, mister, if you don't leave me alone this second, I'm gonna call the police. For a moment, I thought this had worked but it only seemed to escalate the problem. He lunged forward into my doorway and we struggled for a second until I managed to close and lock the door. The police showed up fairly quickly and took down my statement, including his words earlier in the day. Considering he was very intoxicated, they decided to book him with public intoxication and took him into custody. This whole time, his girlfriend sat strangely quiet and did nothing, but once the cops left, I saw why. Dirty Yankee tramp, I'm calling my brother up here and they're gonna take turns tearing you up. She left the door open, so I could hear her make the phone call. Whether she was serious or not, I certainly wasn't going to take the chance. I had had enough of these two hillbillies and their threats, so I quickly packed up the few things I had out and hopped into my car. I drove around until I found a far nicer hotel and checked in. Despite the fact that it was going to cost me much more than the previous place, I felt that my safety was worth it. Thanks to the run-ins I had with a hee-haw couple, I decided to complete my work and make the drive back, straight through. It proved to be rather difficult, but thanks to many cups of coffee, I managed to make it home two days early. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the last time I was in the South. Now, before the comments come in saying that not all Southerners are like that, I want to assure y'all that I'm very aware of that, and in fact, many of my colleagues are Southerners, and they were fine people. With the advent of the internet and interconnectedness of the world, I have had no need to take any further research trips. But if a particular event requires my attendance, and it happens to be in one of those great states, I'll most likely go. With that being said, if ever in my life I am required to visit the fine city of Atlanta, crazy man and bloodthirsty woman, what's never meet again. I was browsing Reddit this afternoon and came across this subreddit for the first time. Even though I'm a big coward when it comes to anything scary, this has to be the perfect place to share a terrifying incident that involved my cousins and myself about 15 years ago. 
At the time this happened, I was approaching my 16th birthday. My family had a big reunion every year in Southern California. Since I hadn't attended since I was little, my parents thought it would be a fun way to spend my summer break. It would also be a great opportunity to get to know my cousins. There was three of them, and they were all girls around my age. After I thought about it, it sounded fun, so I agreed and flew out the next month to Los Angeles. The reunion was held at the same hotel we were all staying in. When I arrived there, I was met by my cousins, Jennifer, Belinda, and Stormy. It was amazing how much alike we all looked. We all had long blonde hair and blue eyes, not to mention our facial similarities, but it made sense since our dads were brothers. The biggest difference was how tan they were. Since I had been inside all winter in Minnesota, they were much darker than me. My uncle and dad decided to let us stay in one room together. It was a big fancy bridal suite. When we saw the room, we came up with this joke that we were sisters and we were staying in the hotel together for my bachelorette party. I was chosen as the bachelorette because I was the oldest and looked a little different, like an older sister often does. We spent the rest of the day at the pool and talking to guys. Stormy, who was only 14, managed to trick a 25-year-old guy into thinking she was 19 and gave her his number. We were having so much fun, we stayed up until about 4 talking and laughing. In the morning, which was about noon for most of us, we ordered breakfast and then headed for the pool again. Our day turned out to be even more fun than the one before it. This time Stormy got a pair of twins to buy her lunch. That girl was on fire that week. Later that evening we all got dolled up and had dinner at the hotel's restaurant. But this time, the story we'd created had taken on a life of its own. My cousins had been telling guys all day that we were there to party and asking them to buy them drinks. But most of the men were wise enough to know that they were lying. After dinner, we joined this cute pair of older guys that were sitting in the lobby. When they noticed us leaving the restaurant, they had asked us to sit with them, and since we had nothing else to do, we did. Once we had sat down, they began asking us our ages and names. Of course, we lied and said we were in our early 20s, and they actually believed us. I couldn't help but giggle a bit. This was the most fun I'd had in years. Jennifer and I didn't say much. We left that to Belinda and Stormy. At one point, Stormy invited them up to our room, but I had to take her aside and remind her that her dad was staying in the room next to ours and would surely not like it. I didn't want to be a stick in the mud, but I wasn't comfortable with having two strange men who looked to be like 30 or something in our room. At the point it was approaching midnight, I told the two younger girls it was time to go back to our room and they argued at first, but once Jennifer backed me up, they gave in. We told the guys to meet us at the pool around 11 a.m. and we get lunch together. Then we went back upstairs to our room. We stayed up talking about the two men and what we were planning on doing when we saw them. That lasted until about 2 a.m. when we decided to go to bed. The lights had just been turned off in the room when we all heard the doorknob start jiggling very fast, like somebody was trying to get in. At first, I thought it was my mind tricking me, but once it started again, I got scared. I asked the other girls if they were also hearing it, and they said yes. Without thinking, Belinda jumped up from her bed and said she would see who it was. I yelled out to her to stop her from opening the door, but it was too late. Jennifer got up and turned on the lights, and I joined her at the end of the hall. When Belinda opened the door, she turned to us and said no one was there, then turned back to the door and stepped out into the hall. That was when we saw a person in a black mask jump out and grab her. As soon as they grabbed her, she began screaming and fighting to get away. By this time, Stormy had joined Jennifer and I. All three of us were also screaming and running for the door to help Belinda. When we made it out into the hall, we saw that the person was attempting to drag her to the elevator. Even though she was fighting as hard as she could, she was losing and getting closer to the elevator. Thankfully, my uncle came out of his room to see what was going on and saw Belinda being dragged away. He didn't hesitate to attack the person in the mask. Once he hit them a few times across the head, they dropped her and ran off down the hall. They made it to the stairwell and disappeared. We all ran to her to see if she was okay. She was obviously scared and upset, but thankfully didn't look to be hurt. Once he was sure she was alright, my uncle called hotel security and told them what had just happened and they called the police. The four of us girls just sat there and held each other and cried. 
We were all so happy that Belinda was safe. Despite the hotel's attempt at catching the person by locking all the doors, the attacker still managed to get away. When the police arrived, we tried our best to describe the attacker, but since they were wearing all black and a mask, we didn't have much to go on. Belinda was pretty sure it was a man, but that was it. Over the rest of the week, we all spoke to the police several times and repeated what we had been doing the past couple of days. When my uncle heard about our little inside joke about being in town for a bachelor party, and how we had been lying to the boys about our ages, he was mad to say the least. The police told him that one of those boys was most likely the one that had grabbed Belinda. His theory was that they were trying to kidnap one of us to potentially sell us to a trafficker. Since we looked so much alike, it didn't matter which one of us opened the door. He said girls that looked like us were super popular in the rest of the world and that traffickers would pay top dollar for one of us. We were all so scared we spent the rest of the week in our room and refused to answer the door for anyone without a key. As soon as the police said it was okay for me to go home, I took the first flight back to Minnesota. I was still scared of strangers for a long time and had to go to counseling to get over the worst of it. From what my cousins told me later, they did also and found it hard to trust boys that they had just met. Unfortunately. The police were never able to find Belinda's attacker and punish him for what he had done. It had been a long time since this happened and when we have taken family trips to Disneyland, I've caught myself wondering if one of the men walking around could be the one that tried to kidnap Belinda that night. Then I'd get a shiver down my spine and remember, it could have just as easily been me. My friend and I are having a contest to see who had the scariest episode in our lives, and I'm positive that once you see this one, you'll vote me as the winner. You may have already read his, the story about the broken window and the guy in the woods, but I assure you, mine will be much scarier. This took place when I was 15 years old, and although I'm 25 now, I'm still not sure of what to think of it. At that time, I was enjoying my life and it seemed to show in my dreams. Almost every one had a positive theme, at least the ones I remembered. Yes, like any normal person, I had nightmares and still do, but they were either not that bad or I forgot them right away. That was unfortunately about to change and on a family vacation to the hillbilly heaven of Branson, Missouri. Each year my family tried to pick a new location to vacation in and this year was Branson. We had been there once, when I was around 10 or 11, but since then, it opened up a lot more attractions, especially musical theaters. We had just driven in from Oklahoma City, so everyone in the car was tired. Thankfully, my parents were meticulous planners, so our hotel rooms were ready for us when we arrived. I guess since my brother and I were approaching the age where we could be trusted, we were given our own room. Then again, maybe they wanted to get busy in peace. It didn't matter to us either way, the room was really nice. It even had its own little living area with a TV and we. We managed to play Call of Duty for around an hour before we decided we should crash. Just like I figured, our folks had us up at the crack of dawn. It never made sense to me why they would do this. I thought the whole point of vacation was to get some rest and relaxation. Instead, they had us up at 8am and we'd have to sit around for another two hours waiting for them. Once they were finally ready to go, my dad would drive us from place to place like his butt was on fire while yelling at Jeff and I the whole time. We couldn't understand why he was so angry and stressed out. That's probably why I don't go anywhere on my holidays off. It always seemed more relaxing just to sit and chill at home. Anyway, we did the usual touristy things that people do in Branson, riding the ducks and stuff like that. We made it back to our hotel room at about 5 to clean up and go out to dinner. I think my dad had some plan for us to go see the Presleys or some hillbilly crap, but we were saved when my brother got sick during dinner, so the remainder of the evening was spent in our room playing the Wii. Jeff started feeling a bit better by bedtime, so we decided to stay up a little longer playing games. I called it about midnight, and it wasn't long before I was asleep. She came at some point, I'm not sure when. I could tell that I'd been asleep for quite some time because it was so hard to move. Then again, that could have been part of her power. Not until later did I see the clock, but 
That would only tell me the time then, and not when she made her entrance. I wasn't aware of her presence at first, but I was already able to see most of the room. My brother was sprawled out in his bed with the covers half off of him, basically the way he'd always slept. The air conditioner's low roar was there hanging in the room, but much quieter than I'd remembered. I just lay there for a moment, taking in the peacefulness of the overall environment, until I noticed a figure just on the edge of my vision. I tried to turn my head sideways to get a better look, but it wouldn't move. This made me a little concerned, and I still had no reason to get upset. Most of the room was still within my sight. When I switched my eyes to the foot of the bed, hers locked with mine. At first, all I saw was her eyes, where her head seemed to grow larger and out of the darkness until it was nearly all I could see. I could feel the rest of her climbing slowly in occasional bursts up my bed. This was when I truly began to panic. The battle to move anything was a loss. It was like I had been frozen in a block of ice, but without the cold. Even when I felt her hands touch me, I was unable to shrink away. I so badly wanted to scream, just get one short sound out. The tears ran down my temples. I was sure I was going to die. She continued to crawl up the bed until her face sat a mere few inches from mine. This was the first time I could clearly see how horrible her face was. She resembled your stereotypical old witch with hairy moles on her chin and black crooked teeth. Her breath was the worst mix of rotting flesh and musty air. When she first saw my tears, they seemed to excite her. She began shrieking and laughing, running her filthy claw-like fingers in small circles on my bare chest. My fight to break free from her continued, but it gained me nothing. Her weight on my body was starting to be too much and I began fighting for air. It became obvious to me that her goal was to suffocate me. I knew I couldn't last long without oxygen, and I would be dead in a matter of seconds. Just as I took in my last breath, I woke up. My body took over from there, grasping at any air it could get. Basically, I was hyperventilating. Within a minute or so, I was finally getting control of my breathing and was able to realize what was going on. I stayed laying there on my back for a minute, maybe to reassure myself I was still alive, very happy to be so. Slowly sitting up, I looked at my body for any scratches or marks, but none were there. I also looked around the room for any sign of the witch, but the only other person in the room was Jeff, still sprawled out in the same position. That was the first time I began analyzing the whole occurrence. Had I really been asleep? having a bad dream, or was it real and what I saw actually happened? Jeff was in the same sleeping position as in my dream. I'd have been able to see everything in the room while being asleep. If I had, that would make that horrid woman real. There was no way I was going to be able to figure it out that night, if ever. I did know I was way too scared to go back to sleep. The alarm clock on the side table said it was 4.35 a.m. Although I was still very tired, I was too afraid to fall asleep, so I went back to the TV and fired up the video. I guess I did nod off again at one point because my mom's banging on the door woke me up at 7.45. After three plus hours of waiting, I was happy to be back on the road for home. Despite our vacation only lasting the weekend, I got the impression that everyone was happy for it to be over. I know I was, and not just because of the nightmare. Speaking of the nightmare, I found myself scared to go to sleep for at least a week, but once it looked as if, though, she wasn't coming back, my life went back to normal. Because of my age, I got to avoid family vacations for the rest of my time at home. I made sure to schedule work, especially heavy that time of year, in order to avoid them. Although I say life soon went back to normal, my fear that she could return still haunts the back of my mind. At least once a week I find myself trying to decide if that was truly a nightmare or if that thing was actually in that hotel room with my brother and I. I've done a small bit of research surrounding sleep paralysis and like and I know the hag, as many call her, is a common part of this problem. If the horror that I went through that night was just a scary dream, I hope I have outgrown the condition. But if that woman and her group of monsters are truly real, 
I can only pray they got their required dose of fear that night and that they never returned to reap another for my newborn son. My daughter is a subscriber, or whatever you call them, to this forum, and she's told me that this would be the perfect place to tell the story of a near-death experience I had roughly five years ago. She'd been prodding me for quite some time to write it down, so here you go. First, I'm going to lay down some brief information to make things that come later in the story make more sense to the readers. At this time, our family, which includes my husband, my daughter, the one that is a member here, and myself were living in El Paso, and I received a phone call from an old friend in Houston. Her news for me was sad, to say the least. She had been diagnosed with breast cancer, and she was wondering if I was free to come down and help her through the treatment until her husband returned from his work assignment overseas. He wouldn't be able to return home for at least a couple of more weeks, and she had no one in the area that she could trust to help her. Being one of her oldest friends, I agreed right away and began packing that night after dinner. Since I'm terrified of flying, my only option to get there was by car. My hope was that I could make the roughly ten and a half hour drive without stopping. I wanted to get to Houston as quickly as possible because her surgery was scheduled for early Monday morning and I would be leaving Saturday morning. Theoretically, it would be no problem getting there by late Saturday but I wanted to figure in the possibility that I'd have to stop and sleep somewhere in that 10 plus hours. Anyone who is to make that drive would know it is very exhausting, especially when you're alone. I was out the door and on the road by 7 a.m. My car had a full tank of gas and I had a cup of coffee. So other than stopping to take restroom breaks, a time I could go also grab snacks, I shouldn't need to stop. Even better, as far as I could remember, I'd be able to follow I-10 all the way there. Things were looking good. Nothing interesting really happened on the drive, other than seeing a few wrecks. That may have been why it proved to be so tiring. I only stopped once during the initial three hours, and that was just to relieve myself. However, after stopping to take a restroom break and eat a Subway sandwich at around 12.45, I noticed after I'd driven another 30 minutes or so, I was getting very tired. I knew I only had about four or so hours left, so I decided to try to power through it. The longer I drove, the harder it was to stay awake. At one point, I came very near to running off the road, but I woke up just in time to avoid it. Now I was scared. I chose to stop in San Antonio and get a hotel room to grab a few hours of sleep. I knew I was only a few hours from Houston, but I was making good time, so it was no big deal if I stopped. I'd feel better when I woke up. So I pulled off the interstate and stopped at the first hotel I saw. The area looked to be safe, so I left my bags in the back seat when I went in my room. I was out almost as soon as my head hit the pillow. When my eyes opened again, it was 10 p.m. and I felt far better than I had seven plus hours before. Since I had the room, I decided to take a shower before I hit the road. On the trip out to my car to get some toiletries, I noticed a man walking toward me but considering he was still a good 50 yards away, I didn't care. I don't know why I should have, he was most likely heading to his room. I wasn't the only person staying here after all. Once I'd showered and was getting dressed, I began hearing the voice of two men outside my room. Initially they spoke with a regular volume, but the discussion quickly escalated to yelling. Since they obviously couldn't see me, I continued dressing and attempting to hear what they were arguing about. One man's voice sounded like he was walking away, but he was by no means shutting up. It appeared the fight had ended, so I walked around the corner and into the bathroom to brush my teeth. I turned on the faucet, and that was about the time the gunshot started. It sounded as if though the battle of the OK Corral was going on outside. Not sure what to do, I laid down in the tub. My theory was that the bullets may be stopped by the metal the tub was made of. I'm not sure if it would work in practice, but I lacked the necessary time to deeply analyze it. The shooting lasted less than 30 seconds. Despite that, I stayed in the tub for another minute or so, just to be safe. When I started to hear the police sirens in the distance, I figured it was safe to come out. I peeked out the curtains and saw no one, so I walked over to the door to get a better look. 
That was when I first saw the bullet holes, or what I assumed to be bullet holes. There were two of them spread roughly two feet apart, and they were about the size of my pinky. The police pulled up as I walked out. It seemed like a good idea to put my hands up, and as it turned out, it was. After they patted me down and were sure I wasn't involved, they asked me what I had seen. I told them what was just written above for y'all, and they asked me to hang around for a little bit to talk to the detectives. Apparently, one of the men involved, the guy standing directly outside my room, had been hit by at least one of the shots. A small blood trail led away from the hotel and down the access road where it seemed to have stopped. I called my friend and told her what had happened and let her know that once I was released, I'd be at her house a few hours later. The cops took my information and finally let me go just after midnight. Still relatively fresh from my nap, I drove non-stop until I made it to my friend's place a smidge after 3 a.m. Her and I figured, since we were already awake, we'd go ahead and make breakfast. While we sat at our table enjoying our meal, I filled her in on all the dirty details involving my drive across the state. I got the feeling that, in certain parts, she didn't believe me, but I guess if I hadn't experienced it, I may not believe it either. Her surgery on Monday went very well. I stayed with her for another week and a half until her husband arrived, then I drove home. I'm pleased to say that the trip back went smoothly. I even managed to make the trip non-stop this time. The excitement of going home must have given me the extra energy I needed. I'm even more pleased to say that after a round of chemo, her cancer went into remission and has been ever since. I can't tell you much more about the shooting. To my knowledge, neither of the men involved were ever caught. I tried to keep up with the story, but it quickly faded away. Since I was never contacted again, I imagine the police just closed the case and moved on. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to end this story, but I guess I'll close by saying, men shooting up hotels and breast cancer, I beg of you, but please never meet again. I'm employed at a Los Angeles area hotel that was recently the scene of one of the strangest freak accidents I've ever heard of. When I say recently, I may mean as soon as yesterday, or as long as five years ago. I'm purposely being vague in order to protect my job and my employer's identity. Don't bother to try to find the place in which this occurred. The few accounts of the incident were reported in a way completely different from the way it happened. I'm just telling this story to make it clear to all of those reading it that life can be snuffed out like a candle, instantly and without warning. With all that out of the way, let's get to the story. When the story took place, I was 27 and had been with the hotel for around three years. I had started as your run-of-the-mill bellboy, but when the opportunity to fill in at the desk came up, I took it. Then a few weeks later, when a permanent job at the desk became available, the managers gave it to me. My managers and myself could tell right off that I was much more suited to desk work. While I had always done my job to the best of my ability, I enjoyed helping people and solving their problems, far more than humping their baggage up and down stairs. Pardon me for tooting my own horn, my only aim is to lay down a small amount of background before I dive headfirst into this crazy tale. My career specifics aside, the hotel itself was always a peaceful and fair working environment. Everyone working there did their level best and on a daily basis to ensure the residents' privacy and safety. Unfortunately, on the day this happened, our usual stellar level of service was found lacking, although through no fault of our own. I guess I've led you on long enough. Let's get to the heart of the matter, shall we? My assistant and I had only just checked in one of the participants an hour earlier. The other gentleman had been in his room since the night before apparently getting very drunk. The guests next door to him reported later hearing glass breaking at around 5 a.m. When I first heard it, I was at the desk completing the morning regular paperwork. The report of the shots made me jump from my chair. I instantly ran out into the lobby asking every employee I saw if they knew where it came from, but no one was sure. Luckily, the lobby was empty of guests since it was still early. Within a few minutes, a call from one of the members of the cleaning staff came through the desk, and I was called back to take it. 
She had been working in one of the fifth floor linen closets and then heard what sounded like a gunshot coming from the room across the hall from her. My assistant and I ran up to the fifth floor and knocked on the door of the room we suspected of being the source of the shot, but received no answer. I used the door key to enter, still quietly announcing our entrance just in case we were wrong, but sadly, we were not. Even though I knew a gun was involved, I was still unprepared for what I saw. Upon turning the corner of the room, I saw his body. The gentleman had apparently put a pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. He was obviously long gone, so I instructed my assistant to call 911 and request they enter through the service entrance in order to not draw attention. He may see this as a crude act, but my job was to think about the hotel's reputation, regardless of my personal feelings. I'm sure the man didn't care. He ended himself in a public place. He had to have known some poor employee would find him. He obviously had no regard for anyone else. Whether you know it or not, people die in hotels on a regular basis, so the police and paramedics were familiar with our practices. When they arrived at the room, they did their job and soon allowed the paramedics to take him away. They gave us the okay to clean the room and within an hour, it looked just as it had before. Like I said, we were very well versed in cleaning up after the deceased, no matter the way in which they pass. I was a little shaken up, but I did my best to stay composed. I was in a position of leadership and I didn't want to let the situation get out of hand. Anyone who felt unable to continue work was allowed to go home and the rest of us had a short meeting in the office so we could air out our concerns. That lasted about an hour and then we all returned to our work. We tried to return to our normal day's routine and until around 11 a.m. that morning we had. However, some short time after then I received a call from another girl in housekeeping. She was obviously upset. Through her tearful words, she told me that when she entered a room to clean it on the sixth floor, she found a man that appeared to be dead on the floor. I'm sure you are thinking the same thing. No way. You gotta be kidding me. I could tell she wasn't, so this time I called the cops myself. They didn't have to be asked this time. They entered through the service entrance once again and met me in the room. I guess they were a bit suspicious about the circumstances because the same detectives arrived to investigate the scene. I left them alone to do their jobs once again and went back to work. Now I was starting to be confused rather than shaken up. Not even hotels have two unrelated deaths in the same day. Chances were astronomical that they weren't. All I could do was wait for the detectives to contact me and let me know what was up. An hour or so later a knock came at my office door. It was one of the detectives. What he told me next is still the craziest story I've ever heard to this day. From what we could tell, the bullet from what occurred this morning on the fifth floor went through the guy's head, through the wall, and diagonally up the floor of this guy's room and hit him in the heart. We were unable to find it this morning, figured it was just stuck in the floor somewhere. He was dead in under a minute. Poor guy never saw it coming. That's probably why he had such a surprised look on his face. Believe it or not, this isn't the first case I've had like this. Sad thing, but it just serves to remind us that life is a precious thing and can be ended in a flash. I'm always sure to tell my wife I love her every day I leave for work, even if we just had a fight. That was it. He said bye and went back to work. My mouth was stuck open. I really thought I'd heard it all growing up in LA. But I've been proven wrong. I felt sorry for both of the poor dudes, but the second guy was just minding his own business, not hurting anyone. It turned out that he was in town to attend his mother's funeral. Now his family would have two funerals to attend. The guy who ended up being the cause of this mess was found a week later. Be a local guy that had just lost all of his savings, he had invested in some scheme. The note that the officers found in his body stated that he had done this in the hotel so his children wouldn't possibly find him. I can respect him for that, but he didn't bother to think about us. The lowly hotel stuff that would have to see his brains sprayed all over the wall. I realized I sound mean, but I still see that guy all the time in my dreams, and it's not cool, believe me. Like I said at the beginning, I posted this story to remind the readers of this sub that we could die at any time, at 6 or 60, 
from flu or stray bullet. Life has no guarantees or promises. Please remember this. I was recently reminded of something the detective told me. I'm always sure to tell my wife I love her every time I leave for work, even if we just had a fight. Since I first remembered that sentiment, I made sure to do the same with my wife. If there is someone special in your life, perhaps you may want to try it. It truly can't hurt. Expressing your love never can. The story I'm about to tell began in the early 80s when I was still a rookie. Keep in mind that all throughout the telling of it, I will purposely be vague and alter names and times to avoid letting those reading it be able to discover the exact identities and locations of those involved in the case. My reason for doing this is to protect the integrity of the investigation and privacy of all the poor individuals thrust into this awful situation. Also, you must remember that since this is still an open case, my desire is to share an interesting and scary story without ruining any chance of it being resolved in the future. So grab yourself a drink, kick back, and prepare yourself for the story of the string of cases I call The Curious Case of the Hotel Homicides. As I said, I was still considered a rookie in the division, only seven months in at this point, and had yet to lead on a case, but this was all about to change when we found the first girl. When I arrived at the first hotel, I only knew the basic facts. Dead woman of the night, strangled with ligature. However, once I saw the extent of the damage to her body and the strange way in which the scene was staged, I knew this would be far from a routine case. The girl had not only been strangled, but had her heart removed from her chest. As you can imagine, the bed she was on was soaked in blood, but other than a few tiny drops inside the shower drain, the rest of the room was spotless. When I say spotless, I mean it. The guy went as far as removing every print from any imaginable service able to take one. The room was cleaner than it had been since it was built, and he was well aware that this would leave us with next to nothing in any way of evidence. We did our best to find any possible witnesses, but in this neighborhood, we had very little luck in the past, so despite an exhaustive amount of canvassing and file searches, we came up with Jack. The most we had was blood, and as you can guess, all of it came back to the girl and no one else. How could you come up with nothing in a hotel room that witnessed thousands of terrible things every year still mystifies me, but as this case continued to unfold, I would soon discover that was a feeling that many of us involved would experience on a regular basis. You must remember that this all occurred in the time before the science of DNA, until that space age of crime would come along, we would be saddled with the deaths of five more women, just related to this case not counting the hundreds of others that would continue to go unsolved in our area. It wasn't long before I caught a new case and, to my amazement, it was another street girl's body in a hotel room. Of course, this second one would play out much like the first. No wits or determinative evidence to lead the investigation anywhere. Before we could complete the canvassing for the second crime, a third girl's body was discovered in the hotel next door from the last. The nerve of this guy was beyond any other I'd ever come across, whether it was during my time on patrol or the short time I'd been on homicide. I want to make it clear that crimes rarely work the way they do on TV shows. You often work a case until you run out of information and move on to the next, and there's always a next. While working that case, you still have the hope more info will pop up on the last one, but more often than not, it never does. The case may not go cold, but you may find yourself waiting months for anything new to come along. Strangely, after the third investigation fizzled out, the next body we were expecting never came. Despite how horrible this may sound, with each failed case we hoped for one more murder. Each time this scumbag took another girl's life it gave us another chance to find the one piece of evidence it would take to put him in the chair. We feared our last opportunity had passed us by. Without any new information coming in for over a year, the small group of detectives put together to wade through the lists of possible suspects and profiles sent in from the FBI and surrounding counties was disbanded, and the detectives involved, including myself, were put on the new cases. Almost as if he was waiting, about a month later, he struck again. 
This murder was relatively the same, but this time, instead of wiping the scene clean, he appeared to have worn gloves. Smudges showed up in multiple locations, but none of the remaining prints could be attributed to any of our suspects, and the ones we did match proved to belong to no one of interest. It may have helped us in later years, when DNA testing became available, to run tests on the little bit of non-victim hairs we had found on the victim's bodies and at the scenes, but these hairs, like most of the little amount of evidence we had compiled in the cases, were lost somehow. In future cases, I was sure to go by the old adage, don't put all your eggs in one basket, to help avoid this type of garbage ever happening again. In addition to our small amount of physical evidence, we had a few local psychiatrists and even the feds create some type of rough psychological sketch of the type of guy we were looking for. But like I'd said several times before, the science that makes crime solving so much easier today still sat a mere few years beyond us and that even applied to the world famous FBI Behavioral Science Unit. The last two murders were much more spread out than the prior ones. It seemed to us almost as if though he was losing his love for it. The crimes themselves were even less violent. He was kind enough to allow the girls to keep their hearts and the scenes lacked the bloodlust that they had in the past. Once again, this guy's actions had us shaking our heads. The overwhelming majority of your serial offender's crimes gradually escalate in ferocity and frequency. Despite the seeming de-escalation in the violent aspect of the murders, he was still very vestigious in his organization, whether it was by avoiding leaving prints or making sure to leave the location of the crime clean and blood-free. To avoid standing out in public, he still had no desire to get caught. I was sure there existed a witness somewhere out there, but whether it was from fear or ignorance, they never came forward. I'm still confident of this now, and I can only hope someday that individual will contact someone, anyone, and tell what they know. But just like before, our man stopped and left us with nothing. If he had known then what we know now, we would have been fairly sure that he was incarcerated for an unrelated crime or moved to another area. This was likely the same reason he had taken the almost year and a half long break before. For over a year, no other murders occurred or witnesses came forward. Like before, we had Jack. That was when I got the phone call. It was your average Saturday afternoon around the house. I had just gotten out of the shower after mowing the lawn and was sitting in a recliner about to open a beer. When the phone rang, I jumped up from my chair and stepped into the kitchen to answer it. The voice on the other end was a middle-aged sounding man and his first words were this. Is this Detective Leonard Duncan speaking? I simply told him yes, although I didn't recognize the voice. I've got something you may want to hear. Again, I answer him simply with, okay. I had no idea what he wanted to say, so I kept my mouth shut in case it was important, and God almighty it was. Leonard, I've enjoyed hunting all these years, but all this new science I've been reading about, not to mention certain things at home, have made it far less desirable. So, I'm moving on. You guys won't have to worry about me anymore. This is the moment I began to realize who it was speaking to me. I held my breath as long as I could, afraid I would miss one single word he said. It was fun while it lasted, but I'm done. Take care, Leonard. That last line gave me chills. He spoke as, as if we were old friends saying goodbye forever. That was it. Before I could say anything, he'd hung up and left me alone with the droning of the dial tone. I'd just spoken to a serial killer on the phone. I called into the station to see if they could get a trace on the call, but he'd of course spoken too briefly for us to get one. I wasn't sure if I could trust what he'd said. After all, he was a murderer, but it had been quite some time since we had come across another girl in a hotel room and a large part of me wanted it to be true. The lives of six girls had been taken by this man then. If we couldn't find him, couldn't a promise to take more be good enough? Had I unwillingly made a deal with the devil, I'm still not sure, and it's over 30 years later. In the end, regardless of whether I agreed or not, he had control of the situation and he knew it. Once or twice over the years, we had a few strong leads, but 
they all ultimately went nowhere. Since I've retired, I still regularly do searches for any new cases with a similar M.O. to our guy. At this point, he's most likely dead or in a nursing home somewhere, but if anything, it helps me sleep better at night. The result of losing most of our physical evidence long ago has left us with few other options. Unless we get a confession or an eyewitness, these poor girls' murderers will never go solved. However, until I join my wife in heaven, I'm going to do my utmost to nail that monster and give those girls and their families the justice they have waited for for far too long.